thanks everyone. Uh, so um, this is training your first model with Python Orange webinar. Uh, I've made the notebook available in my GitHub here. So if you want, you can try to follow, you can follow along. Uh, here is a link directly to Google Colab, so it will open you and you can you can run it. This is what we're doing here. You can install it locally too, but that's so much more convenient to use it in Google Colab. So right, let's just do it. Um, so before we started, make sure that uh, if you're running this, make sure that you use a GPU, right? Because we we see some uh, some things with tensors and where they are located. So if you use GPUs, we already uh, we can learn a little bit more 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 about this, uh, and also to make it a little bit faster. Uh, so make sure that you have this, and then we can start, right? Um, so yeah, see, this this will work better if you run locally because it will make it uh, larger the 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 screen, right? But here for in Google Colab, it won't make a difference. So just a, a little brief, brief about me, as uh, as it was already mentioned, I'm a data scientist, teacher, and author. I've been working for over twenty years and almost ten years in in with data science. Uh, and I'm author of this Deep Learning with PyTorch step-by-step series of books, which I'm going to bring it back at the end of this. I also have a surprise for you at the end uh, regarding the book. Uh, so why PyTorch, right? Uh, PyTorch is like the fastest deep learning framework. Uh, the, it's been growing a lot lately. It displays TensorFlow in, in, in academia and it's still not, not so much in, in, in the industry. But that's very promising. And uh, a few months ago, there, there was also this development with PyTorch Foundation, where all the major players, Amazon, Google, NVIDIA, um, and Microsoft. So everyone is coming together with Meta to support the development and the, the, the open source character of, of PyTorch. So everyone can contribute to it. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest fans of PyTorch is Andrew Carpati, right? Uh, I mean, I, I'm assuming that um, everyone knows him because this is one of the most important uh, person in the in the area. And as early as 2017, he said, yeah, I've been using PyTorch a few months and I never felt better. I have more energy, my skin is clearer, my eyesight has improved. Uh, I think this was particularly striking when you compare uh, because of the eager mode execution of PyTorch, right? Which is the, the, the fact that you run something and you get the results right away, which is different from the, the, the initial implementation of TensorFlow where it had to do everything and only get the results at the end, which was a, a, a bit uh, harder to, to handle. Uh, and it's also not uh, now TensorFlow has caught up and both of them you offer both modes, right? So this difference that uh, Andre was mentioning five years, almost six years ago now is not so uh, important anymore. But I think it's funny to, uh, to point this out, right? Uh, then what's the motivation behind this webinar or, or my approach to learning PyTorch? Uh, usually when you go to a tutorial, they, they will go with some really fancy, uh, back then it was a computer vision um, uh, problem, right? We do image classification or object detection or something that's interesting in the problem itself, right? But maybe overwhelming for a beginner. So if you're starting your learning process, I always thought that tutorials would... Uh, uh, overwhelm it may overwhelm uh, someone that's learning because you have a lot of complexity that's attached to the task at hand and it kind of distracts you from what your uh, goal would be it would be learning the tool itself so in order to to handle that i developed this this, this approach that i introduced a very simple problem like a linear regression which is as as simple as it can be then you know what you the model is not not uh, difficult to, to understand, right? We're generating some data ourselves, so it's even easier. But then you can focus all your attention into learning how PyTorch works, right? Because you're trying to learn a model that's super simple. Um, that's what I'm calling a structural incremental from first principles approach, right? Because you're doing step by step and figuring out all, all the necessary elements and how they uh, can be put together. So you develop your model and you train you use PyTorch to train it. Uh, what well, the agenda is, like as I said, we're starting with a simple problem, a linear regression. We talk about tensors. Then we go uh, building a data set and a data loader to split it into mini batches. We'll talk a little bit about sequential models. 
Then we go into gradient descent in five easy steps, which basically uh, is uh, the, the steps of gradient descent are can be mapped to what would the training loop will be in PyTorch. So we have this nice correspondence one-to-one -one with each one of the steps, and we will see them uh, in more detail. Then we talk about loss, the autograd, which is the idea that you don't have to compute the gradients manually, right? PyTorch is going to do that for you, which is, well, for, of course, is the, like the, the, the biggest advantage. Let, let's put it like that. You don't have to worry about chain rule, uh, computing gradients, or anything like it. Uh, and then you at the end, you have also the, the optimizer, which will, could be SGD, could be Atom. We're going to go into a little bit more detail in this session, too. And as I said, the, the idea here is to provide you an overview of all the, these bits and pieces so you can start your journey and then dig deeper with other materials to, to learn more about each one of those steps. But I think this uh, hopefully will give you uh, a good idea of, of the whole thing. So let's talk about the linear regression, right? So let's start with something that's, like, as I said, as simple as it can be. A linear regression with a single feature X, right? So cannot be any simpler. Basically, you have your target is going to be a, a bias or intercept plus a one single way uh, and your feature X and some error. You can think of this as a simple neural network, right? It has only one node, this node uh, here, right? Uh, one output, which is going to be Y, and your linear activation function just means that you don't transform the output. You're going to just give uh, get this result and output it right away. So, um, a neural network with a single node, right? Not even a network, it's just a node, but okay. So we start with that. And as I said, well, how can we make sure that we we are positive that our model is training well? Well, if we know the, the data, if we have generated the data ourselves, we you know for sure what we're generating, right? Uh, so basically what I'm doing here is just, I'm generating a hundred points, right? For a feature X. And then I'm saying, I'm defining that B, this B here, the bias is going to be one and the weight should be two, right? Uh, and then I'm using these two values that are the true values of the parameters that I will be learning later. I'm going to be using them to generate some synthetic data that we can train on. Uh, so let's run this. And you see here, I'm just using NumPy to generate 100 data points. And of course, I had to add some noise to it, right? Otherwise, it would be a straight line. And then it will I mean you'll never find a real data that's like a perfect straight line. Um, then, as expected, I'm going to separate split it, this data into training and validation sets, right? So this is just standard procedure here. And then let's take a look what our data looks like. And you see, as expected, the intercept here, the bias is one, right? So you see the, the, this is where uh, the line intercepts the y-axis and the inclination, the, the, the slope is uh, two, right? So here you go one, here you go two in, in distance. So we know that we have the data and we know that we like our model to find out at the end that B equals one and W equals two, right? So that's our goal. Now let's, 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 uh, Let's start, right? Well, since we have the data, now we can actually do something with it. And first we have to talk about the concept of tensors, right? Uh, what is a tensor anyway? And I really like this picture to illustrate it, right? So here's the source, this guy, he uh, makes some really cool drawings and this one is perfect for illustrating the concept. So if you are used to NumPy, you know that in NumPy you may have arrays with many dimensions, right? One, two, three, four, 15 dimensions. Uh, and the thing is, if you have zero dimensions, it's just a number, it's a scalar number, right? Uh, if you have like a vector, that's like a list of, of elements. If you have uh, an array, it's like a, like a table. And you have three or more dimensions, that's called the tensor. So for all intents and purposes uh, here in this tutorial, and in general, when you're handling uh, deep learning tasks, you can assume that a tensor is just a multidimensional array. Right? Of course, physicists will probably not agree with this definition because that comes more to it. But for practical purposes, you can just make it uh, simple like that. And uh, in general, in, in the literature, you see that uh, basically either you have a scalar or vectors and matrices and, and of course, uh, tensors themselves. We call everything else that's not a scalar a tensor. So if you have a vector one-dimensional 
uh, vector, then you call it a tensor too. Uh, of course, you can create tensors in many different ways. This is very similar to the way that you create, you can create NumPy arrays. So you may have create here a scalar vector, a matrix or a tensor, right? With random, you see here, just creates multiple dimensions. So of course, we're not uh, spend too much time on this. It's just to illustrate that tensors in NumPy arrays, they are very much alike. They will be actually even share the, the underlying, the, um, the underlying data in memory, right? So they are both pointing to the same place in memory. So if you make changes to the NumPy array and you create a tensor out of it, if you make changes to one, it will be reflected in the other. But, but uh, I may be getting ahead of myself here. Uh, you can, of course, use shape and size to figure out the size of the tensors, right? So you see here, you can reshape them. And then you just, you know, this should be familiar if you if you are uh, used to NumPy, this is probably the same. Uh, just make sure that I want to highlight that if you reshape them, right, or if you, if you view them, you're not uh, creating a new tensor. You're just creating a new representation with different number of dimensions of the same underlying data. So if you change, if for instance, here I have like new tensor one, right, new tensor two, if I change, the, the original tensors then I'll be reflecting these in the reshaped ones. Uh, and if you, if you want to really copy the data, you can use like new tensor or clone, but most likely you will not be needing to do this, right? So you always want to save memory. That's a good thing that the, the data is being uh, stored only once, even though it can be understood with different shapes. What to go next? So. Now we have tensors, right? These tensors, as I was talking about the memory, right? They live in the main uh, memory of the computer. But most of the cases, if you're training a real uh, a real model or a, a larger model, you want to use GPU, right? That's why I also uh, ask you to choose the runtime with the GPU because then you will see the difference here. Uh, how can you send a tensor to, um, to a GPU? First, you need to load it into memory, into the regular memory, right? And in this case, we can create tensors out of NumPy arrays. So these were the two NumPy arrays that we created at the, start, at the beginning when we created our, our synthetic data, right? And you can use S tensor to create a PyTorch tensor out of them. So see here, these are just regular tensors. And as I said, this one is created in the main memory of the computer. If you want to use a GPU, you need to send it to the GPU. So basically to copy this data from the main memory to the GPU memory. Um, and the way to do that, you can do using this two method, sending to a device. What are the devices in this case, right? So we can actually define a device being CUDA if uh, CUDA is installed, right? If you have a GPU and to make the GPU work, you need to install the drivers. You need to go to the NVIDIA uh, documentation to install the proper driver for your, your, your operational system. This may be uh, a bit difficult and, and, and hard to install. That's why also Google Colab is so convenient because it's already taking care of everything for you. Uh, so if you, check, if you want to check if it is, the GPU is available, you can use this. And if it's not, then you can fall back to the CPU. So that's always a good practice to start with this, right? Because then you, if you have a GPU that makes everything faster, awesome, you use it. If not, you just fall back to the CPU and hope for the best because it will likely take longer, right? So if we do this, now you see that now to have recreated our tensors. You see that it's taking a little bit of time because pretty much Google Colab is, is spinning up a GPU in, in the back end, but now it's done, right? So you have the tensors here, but you can still, you cannot see a difference, right? See here, you have tensor, here you have tensor too, but this one was GPU, this one is actually, this one was CPU, sorry, and this one is actually GPU. How can you say tell the difference? You see, if you check the type, now you see that's, torch.cuda.flow tensor. And if you want to bring it back to NumPy, right? You can try to do this. And uh, I, I would like to point out to this error that if you try to uh, convert the tensor back to NumPy, 
you should be careful because uh, in that case, you cannot do it directly from a GPU tensor. Why is that? Because when you have a, G, uh, a tensor in the GPU, NumPy do not and cannot access the memory in the GPU. It cannot. It does not have access to the data that lives inside the GPU, only in the, in the main memory of the computer. So if you want to bring it back to NumPy, first you have to remove or take out your tensor out of the GPU, back to the, the regular memory, and then you can make a NumPy array. Luckily, this is easy to do. You can just do like CPU here, right? This will convert the x train tensor to a CPU and then to a NumPy. Um, and you can, every time you need to do that, I strongly recommend that you use this CPU method uh, because if it's already in the CPU, that's a no cost operation. So it will not uh, make it anything slower at all. And if it's on GPU, uh, then it will prevent this exception from being raised. So that, that's uh, that's important to, to keep in mind. So you see here our x train tensor now is back as a, a NumPy array, and you have all this data here. So we have tensors, right? We have an x train tensor and a y train tensor. Cool, but how can we make them into a data set? So PyTorch has, conveniently for us, a data set class. Right, uh, and if from the point of, to to interpret to to have a, a a picture in your mind of a data set is, you can think that's a Python list, or just a list of of all the elements into in the the data set where each one of these elements is a tuple, right? Uh, where each 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 tuple has features and labels, and uh, sorry, features and the corresponding label. Uh, and in the case that we are having here, where our data set is super simple, right? It's not an image, it's, it's, it's not a text, which would be a, a harder problem to handle. We're just handling a linear regression here. So we have only uh, numbers. So we can use a tensor data set, which is a very uh, convenient and simple data set that comes together with PyTorch. Uh, of course, you can uh, create a custom data set where you define how the data is being retrieved. Let's say that you have data in, in your disk and thousands of images, you want to load them on demand. You know, there is a lot of functionality that you can uh, uh, implement or you, you, you can have um, working for you. But uh, I think that would be too complex to handle right now, right? Uh, and the idea is that let's keep it simple with the tensor data set uh, in, in, and then we, we move, move on with that. Um, the tensor data set is created as uh, using the tensors that we have, right? So here you see, just for the sake of completion, we're creating the tensors for X and Y, and I'm creating a data set. And as I said, a uh, data set works like a list, right? So I can, I can actually do even, I can retrieve and if they were a list, if I wanted to get the 10th element of my, my data set here, this is one tuple, right? We have X is 0.12 and the, the, the label, the target here in this case is 1.24. So that's just a list, right? You can, you can also do stuff like this, it's slicing like a list. So think of a data set as a list and you're good to go. And so let's remove this because we don't need it. Right. Uh, one thing that uh, I would like to point out is that I've just shown you how to move tensors to a GPU, right? So you know that the difference between the, the two devices. But in, in, in practice, you only do this moving from one device to the other when you're actually using the data to train the model. Uh, and when you're creating the data set, this is not such a good idea because, I mean, you may have a computer that has like 40 gigabytes of memory, but the GPU has only six, right? Your GPU's memory is always more expensive than regular memory. So you don't want to uh, like cram your uh, GPU with a lot of stuff that's not being needed. Uh, you want to be parsimonious in that sense. You want to use it only as needed. So you keep all your data in the, the main memory of the computer and you send it to the GPU uh, on the when it's needed as, an, uh, uh, as needed basis, right? So what I'm doing here, I'm creating, I'm not sending anywhere. So these, these tensors here, they are CPU tensors. Uh, and the data set as well is referring to these tensors in the CPU. 
and we'll see shortly when we're going to send them again to the GPU for the purpose of training. Uh, the, once you have a data set, what you can do next is use a data loader. The data loader is um, the, the, the piece of, of um, the component that's going to help you in splitting your data into mini batches, right? Because you're not using, I mean, we could in, in our simple uh, example here, use all the data because it's just 100 points, right? That's uh, fake data anyway. Um, but in reality, you always want to use mini batches. Uh, and of course, you doesn't make any sense to try to do it manually. So what PyTorch does, it just gives you a data loader, which uh, where you tell it what, what the data set is, what's the mini batch size that you want to use, and if you, sh if you sh should shuffle it or not. Uh, and shuffling is always a good idea. Uh, except if you have time series, then you have to be careful if you're not like leaking data of the future into the past and all these sort of things. But we're not handling time series data here. So you can, uh, and if you have images on it, something that does not have any time component in it, just you, you can be, you can safely shuffle. It will help uh, with the convergence uh, of the model when it's training. So if you create a train loader like this, Right. What will happen then? It that uh, the the data loader is actually an iterator. Basically, it means that uh, when you call it uh, next to it, right, it will just retrieve the next mini batch. So you can just loop over the iterator, and every time it will uh, spit out a different mini batch for you. So you have sixteen data points. That's one mini batch. You call the next. You get another one, and so on and so forth. Um, and then this, I'm calling these right X train batch and Y train batch should be mini batch, right? But uh, that's a given here. Uh, and this is the point where you are actually sending the data to the device, in this case, the GPU, right? Because then you're going to use this mini batch and this mini batch alone with 16 data points to make one update to your model. Um, so we have data set with a tensor data set and a data loader, right? So we're, we're covered with uh, as far as the data goes. Now we have to talk about the, the, the model itself, right? We know that our model has two parameters, B and W, right? That was the simple one node neural network. We could create tensors for parameters individually like these, right? B and W. And the difference between a tensor that works for data and a tensor that works for the model is that data does not change, right? We're gonna just feed the data to the model, but it stays the same. Um, and But uh, the parameters of the model, B and W, we want to learn them. So what does it mean learning a parameter? It means updating the parameter as you go to make it better and better as training progresses. And how do we tell PyTorch, okay, we need a tensor that's gonna be updated. So that's a tensor that requires gradient. We're going to compute the gradients to see uh, how much we need to change the parameters, update them, if you will, to make the model better. So that's what our required gradient here is going to tell you to do. Uh, of course, uh, this would be very uh, easy to do with a simple model like this. Well, let's say that you have even a linear regression with like, I don't know, 57 uh, different parameters, right? I don't know, some econometric model, the, the whole lot of parameters. You don't like to create a, like a many, many different um, uh, weights and biases for it, right? Uh, so it's very unlikely that you have to do manually like this. I wanted to show you this because I wanted to tell you that, okay, uh, these tensors that are used for parameters do have uh, this requires gradient um, attribute as true. What you're going to do in, in practice is just create a linear layer for the linear regression. Basically, the linear layer here is telling, okay, I'll get one input, that's one feature, and we get one output, which is the Y that we have in our regression. And if I create this, you see my layer here has bias and the weight. So I have B and W inside this one, right? If I were to create like uh, two inputs and one output, meaning that would be a linear regression with two features, then you see that actually my weight here would be actually two weights, right? 
uh, and bias is only one because I still have one node. Uh, let's go back to what we have here. And it's important to, to, to point out that I'm using here a seed, right? Because then I always get the same uh, parameters here, right? So I'm always initialize the same. So if you, if you run yourself uh, in this Google Colab and you see that you're going to get exactly the same two, right? Because it's random, but I'm telling you, okay, start with this seed. So it always give me the same results. So it's important to, to, especially for learning, right? That you can reproduce and you know what's expected to come out of it. That's why well, I'm, we're always setting the manual seed here. Um, so I just threw the layer concept uh, in here, right? But what actually is a layer? Uh, a linear model can be seen as a layer. So here, for instance, we had like three inputs, three features. In that case, we could have like one hidden layer that we do not have in our simple problem uh, and one output layer. So here, this would be like uh, a linear tree five because it's going to map three inputs into five intermediate outputs, right? And then it will be followed by a second layer where you have five inputs, intermediate ones, into one final uh, one output at the end. So it will be three five followed by a five one. Uh, we're not going into a, a deeper mod, not so deep, but we're sticking with the simple one for the sake of this problem, right? But you see that um, later on, if you want to, to make it more complex models, you just add more layers to it. Uh, and then you, you, you that's the, generate the same idea. There are many different layers, right? So convolution layers, if you're handling images, pulling layers, padding layers, also for images, non-linear activation like ReLU and Gallo, you know, uh, or uh, hyperbolic tangent as in uh, back in the day, normalization, recurrent layers, transformer layers that will be used mostly for NLP, you know, linear, which the one that we're using here, drop out layers. So there is a whole lot of, of different layers that are course implemented in Pintor you that can use uh, depending on the task that you that you're, that you're handling. Uh, of course, for now, also because it's a very short uh, webinar, we sticking with a simple linear layer for now. And then how do you, how do you, a, a, a layer itself can be seen as a model, right? Uh, but apart from a simple tutorial like this, most likely you're gonna have to, you're gonna use multiple layers in sequence as in the picture that you have just seen here, right? You see, you have at least one hidden and one output layer. So how can you do that? For instance, you can create what's called a sequential model. A sequential model, as, as the name says, is simply, the, it takes the output of one layer and feeds as an input to the next, and then the output of this goes into the next, and so on and so forth. Um, and you, one, one way to, of, of creating it is just you can create a model using sequential. And if you want to give it names to it, which is convenient to keep track of what's what inside the model, you can use this add module method here. And I'm calling my layer simply linear. And I'm adding a linear layer which has one feature and one output. And I'm just for the sake of completion here, I'm also specifying that it's including the bias. So if I run this, you see that I have a sequential model with my the name of the module that I added here and one input and one output. So that's a model, right? It's a super simple. If you if you if you had more and more layers, you could just, you know. Oops, you could do so add another one, like and then of course you need to like call it a different name, like linear two, you know, and then these, of course, these will need to match this because you you the inputs, the outputs of one must be the same as the inputs of the next. Right. But I also don't want to, to make it more complicated than it needs to be at this moment. So we're sticking with a, a simple one, one layer only. Talking about device one more time, um, what's important that both model and the mini batch data should live in the same device. Because of course, you're trying to feed the data to the model and then they need to be in the same device. So if you are in the CPU, they need to be both in the CPU or both in the GPU. So what you're doing here with the model is also use the two method to send it to the same device as the data. So that's important. Um, 
One other thing that uh, about the model, you, you can use this very convenient method called state dictionary. Then it will not tell you what are the all the parameters that are uh, that are part of this model. And in this case, you see that we have linear because we called it linear here. And then the linear layer, as we have seen before, has a weight and a bias um, parameters. So now we have linear dot weight and linear dot bias. And then you can expect what's what the state of the model at this point. And you see the device in this case is the GPU already, right? Because I sent the model to the device. So both parameters are in the GPU. You can also, of course, get them like this, right? Model.linear.weight, and you're still gonna get the same tensor that you can uh, use for, for anything. Uh, <clears throat> so we have data, we have a model, right? But of course, our model at the start is gonna be pretty bad, right? Because if we're just randomly initializing it, it could be anywhere, it could be pointing in any direction, the linear regression. We need to make it better we need to make the model learn and fit to the to the data points that we have so that's the point of using gradient descent right we're going to use gradient descent to to optimize our model in such a way that it gets closer and closer to the the data that we're using to train it uh, and these are the steps right first uh initializing parameters we're doing it randomly then we're going to compute the predictions for the model with this really bad model that we start with to see how bad it is. Uh, we're going to compute the loss, which is basically saying how bad it actually is. We use this information to compute the gradients. And the gradients are going to tell us, OK, you need to focus on this, you need to focus on that, which one of the parameters are going to be uh, have to have larger updates to make it the model uh, as a whole better. Then we're going to update the parameters and then do it again and again and again uh, until we're satisfied with the, the final result. Uh, so let me start with the first one. I mean, uh, you don't need to explicitly initialize them. For the moment that you create uh, a model like this, as long as you set a seed as we're doing here, it will always initialize them in the same way for this model. Uh, I don't want to overwhelm you with uh, too much information, but it's important to know that um, for a simple model, random initializing with pretty much anything would most likely work. But for more complex models, initializations matter. Uh, in that sense, PyTorch has many defaults implemented inside in each one of those layers that we have seen, like linear convolution, you know, all these layers, they have some uh, rules inside that initialize them according to, to best practice. People discuss them all, uh, this thing uh, often, uh, but for now, especially if you're starting, you can just assume, okay, cool, whatever is in there, it's, it's good enough for me. Uh, and then if we initialize this, you see that we have these two uh, numbers, right? The two values for the parameters, which are the same that we have been getting all the time because I'm always using the famous 42 seed, right? Um, as I said, the next step would be to use the model to compute predictions. Uh, and then if you think of from the structure of the, of the model that we define at the very start, it would be the bias plus the weight times the X feature. You could do it like this, right? And then you get really bad predictions because the model is, is still random. But of course, I don't expect, uh, no one should be uh, expected to do this manually, right? You're not doing this. That's you, we built a model for a reason, right? Uh, basically, we just use the model and we call uh, the the model itself with the, the the training data. And you see, actually, we're gonna get the same result, right? Because effectively, what this model is doing is producing the output of a linear of a linear regression. Uh, yeah, you may be tempted to do this. Right, because each model, especially if you implement your custom model, which, uh, as I said, you, you can do, uh, you need to implement a forward method. Uh, but please don't, because uh, if you do forward method, you may be skipping lots of things that happen under the hood that PyTorch does. And this is not a concern at this moment, because, like I said, this is a very simple model. But as things go more complex, it's good to learn that you should always do it like this. Um, Still regarding the model, 
the model ha may have two different modes of operation, training mode and evaluation mode. Uh, and the training mode, basically, uh, you, you have to set it. You have That's the default, right? But it's also good practice to explicitly set the model into training mode at the moment that you're trying to train it. And once it's uh, you want to check the, the, the performance on a validation set, or if you wanted to deploy it, then you should set it to evaluation mode, which you're gonna, not going to see uh, in this uh, short webinar because we will we, we'll probably not have uh, enough time. But uh, I would point out that this is important because some of the layers and the most um, important example is the dropout layer, uh, which can be used for regularization of the model and make the model more robust. Uh, they have distinct behaviors in training and evaluation. Uh, so that's important that you always set the mode of the model correctly, because otherwise you may get, uh, you don't want to make it training mode in production, because if you have dropout, you're gonna have uh, like uh, somewhat random predictions and your users are gonna be really mad at you because of that. So always keep in mind that you need to set the proper uh, mode for, for the model. So you can do this, right? You can do model.train, just sets the mode. And of course, for us, it doesn't make a difference because it's super simple. You still get the same results. What's next? We know that our model is really bad, right? Because we initialize it randomly. So, what, what, but how bad is, is it? We need to have a, a measure of how good or how bad the model is. And that's the purpose of the loss. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to make this, uh, to point out to this fundamental difference between error and loss. Error is the difference between what you predicted for a given data point and what is the correct result, what's the target. So that's the error for one single point, while the loss is actually an aggregation of all the errors. Because right, you compute error for this point, for this point, for this point, you get all of them together, and then you compute the loss, which it tells you as a whole, using the data that you use to train the model, how bad it is. And for a linear regression, this aggregation is actually the mean squared error, MSC loss, right? And this is the, the one that you're going to be using for our problem. Um, one other thing that I would like to point out, it's depending if, of how many of your data points you use uh, to compute the loss, this is going to tell you if you're using batch, mini batch, or stochastic gradient descent. Uh, in the stochastic gradient descent, you use one simple, uh, one single data point to compute the loss. So error and loss are going to be pretty much the same, right? You're going to square it, but th that's it. If you use all data points, that's batch. Of course, you're also not doing that because uh, most of the time you have too many data points to fit uh, in memory anyway. So what everyone does is like using mini batch. This is why this is why we created the data loader. Uh, and I like this picture to illustrate the difference because batch is like stable. It gets you in a nice way to the optimal to the optimal point most of the time, but it is slow. Right. While the stochastic is super fast, but it just goes around, you know, it's very erratic. And the mini batch is the good compromise between the two. That's why mini batch is what is being used in practice, right? You eventually get there and it's not as erratic as stochastic. We could, of course, uh, compute the error like point by point doing this and computing the mean squared error using the loss like this, right? Manually. Of course, we're not doing that, right? This is just to show you what would be like. Um, what we're doing, we're using uh, PyTorch's M MSE loss to compute the, the loss for us. What we need to, to keep in mind in this case is that when you do N, and this is from PyTorch uh, NN module, if you do this, this, is, this creates another function for you. So that this uh, MSE loss is not the loss function itself. Is like a higher order function that gives you back the function that then you're going to use to compute the loss. So you see here, I use this to create another function and I call it fn for function to make it more clear. And then I use this again with my predictions and the labels here. So if you see, you compute here, you see this loss is the same as we had here when you computed manually, right? So. 
just keep in mind that you should not it should, sh this one should not be used with the data itself in predictions this one is to create a loss function that then is going to be used with the predictions so we know that our model is relatively bad because we have a loss that indicates how bad it is what we do next is we use this measure of how bad the model is to uh, compute the gradients. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm just showing you this here for the sake of completion. We're not going to compute, use derivatives or anything like it. But the point is that the gradient pretty much is how much the loss will change if you change one, one of the parameters at a time just a little bit. So if I increase a little bit my bias or if I increase a little bit my weight, how much impact is going to have on the loss? If I increase the weight, is my loss getting lower? That's good, right? So I want to increase my weight because I want my loss to go lower. Because the, the, the loss is telling me that the model is bad. The higher the loss, the worse the model. So if I minimize the loss, if I have the loss as close as possible to zero, it means that my model is as good as it can be. It will never be zero, right? But it will, yeah, hopefully we get close enough. Uh, again, this is just for the sake of completion, right? You could create, compute the gradients manually like this. No one's going to ever do that. What you're going to do is use the autograd, which is basically the feature of PyTorch that computes gradients for you. So it does all the hard work. And for that, you can simply get the loss that we had before, like 0.70. So the value was 0 0.757. Uh, and this is a Python variable, right? So we're going to use this Python variable, but this, since it's being tracked by PyTorch, we can call backward. And if we do this, like magic, the gradients are computed for all the parameters inside the model that um, was used to make these predictions. So you see the model here takes input data, computes predictions that are used against the labels to compute the loss, and this computes the gradients for you. We can actually check them, and you see that we have gradients for the weight and for the bias, and they should match these two guys here that we computed manually, and they do, right? Just a different order, but still the same. Um, one thing that's important is that also, by default, PyTorch uh, the, does accumulate gradients. It does not reset them all the every time. So if you do a loop and you don't zero the gradients uh, explicitly, you're going to get larger and larger gradients. And of course, this is not what we're looking for here. So you always need to zero them in the end. Uh, here, I'm zeroing them one by one. But again, this is just to show you the, the, the different steps. But we're going to have a, 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 an easier way to do that like in shortly, in a, in a couple of minutes. And this is what we're going to do with the optimizer, because of course, you'd also don't want to compute gradients, even if the, the gradients are computed automatically by PyTorch, you don't want to update each parameter manually, right? What you want to do is to use an optimizer to do that. What the optimizer is going to do is going to use the gradients that were computed by PyTorch, uh, represented by these partial derivatives here, Multiply by this letter that that's eta in Greek, which looks like a letter N. It is the learning rate, right? Which is going to tell you how fast you want to update your parameters. Um, and this, this is what the optimizer is going to do for you. Uh, there are many different optimizers uh, available. One was the stochastic gradient descent, which is like the most the most basic one. There are another uh, optimizer called Atom that probably is familiar to you. That's like very popular. It really yields uh, good results out of the box. Uh, and you see the path. I just plotted two different paths here. You see the Atom is more smooth because it does does some uh, smoothing uh, and averaging of the gradients internally. We're not going to get into details of this. But then it will, it allows the, the the updates to be smoother and converge faster than SGD, right? Um, so what? How can we do that? How can we use them uh, SGD to or Atom for that matter to update parameters? You basically use PyTorch because it has like all the optimizers like Atom or SGD. You basically just have to tell the parameters of the model that you want to use. In that case, model.parameters is going to 
tell it, okay, all the parameters of this particular model, and you give it a learning rate, which in this case, we're using 0.1, which is high, but for a simple example like this is fine. And then the optimizer will be aware of all the parameters that are that belong to that model. And you can check them if you want. You see that this is actually similar to the state dictionary that you have seen before, right? So it's quite, quite similar, but this is the way that you tell the optimizer which one are the parameters of interest for the update. Um, as I said, um, you're not gonna zero the gradients of each one of the parameters yourself. What you're gonna do, first, you're gonna um, compute the gradients, but what the backward here is doing. Then you're gonna ask the optimizer, please update my parameters once. And the optimizer is gonna take care of everything. It knows the parameters, it knows the gradients, it knows the learning rate. So if you do this, it updates the parameters. If we check the gradients, they are still there because PyTorch does not zero the gradients by itself. But now if you if you do get the optimizer and you make it zero grand, you call it, and it's gonna go to all the parameters and zero them, all of them for you. So you see now both gradients that were like this, now they are all zeros. So you're good to go, right? If you check then the weight and bias, you see now you have slightly um, different values that we had before because the, the model got a little bit better because we performed one update on it. Um, so I, I know that's a bit fast. I'm, I'm giving you a lot of information, but I really wanted to, to finish this in time. Um, so the learning rate is actually one of the most important, the most important hyperparameter of all. Uh, and the choice of learning rate is going to drive your model either to converge or to diverge, right? If it's way too high, then you're gonna get your loss increasing. Then you know that's that's off. It's completely, it's not good. If it's too small, it will take a long time, but we'll eventually get there. But usually, in, especially in this, if you're using cloud providers, time is money because you have to pay for, for computing time. If it's too high, then you may get the impression that's going well, but it may get stuck. And of course, there is also what's the ideal or not so ideal, but a good learning rate will give you a, a good um, descent in the loss here, right? And then it's going to get stable because this is as far as it could go. Uh, that's tricky, right? The, um, um, there are many ways of trying to find the learning rate. There are cycling learning rates. There are scalars. There are, there's a, a whole topic on its own. So we're not covering this here. Um, but I wanted to highlight the importance of the learning rate for uh, training of deep learning model. And in the end, what we do with all the steps that I have done so far, initializing, making predictions, computing gradients, computing the, the loss, sorry, first, then computing gradients and the predicted parameters, we're going to do this over and over again for as many times as we want or until we finish our budget. Also, that's a that possibility, right? Uh, if you put every, all, the, all the pieces of code together, you see that we have creating a model here, creating a loss function here, creating the optimizer in this line here. Then we do one loop over the epochs. And the definition of epoch is if you use all your data points, then you finish one epoch. So if I have like 80 data points and my mini batch is 16, I do five mini batches. And after the end of the fifth, then I, I have one epoch complete because I used all of them. So you see that inside the each epoch, I'm looping over the data in my train loader, each one of the mini batches. Uh, and then I send them to the device. I send them to the GPU. I, my model is already on the GPU. You see here, I compute the loss. I compute the gradients. I update parameters with stamp and I zero everything. And then again and again. So if you run this, if we check now, our model is trained, right? We got a bias of 1.02. We know because we created the data at the beginning that the real value of the bias is one, so close enough. And the weight we created as being two, the true weight, uh, we got 1.97, which is also very close, so it looks good, right? We can do a sanity check because it's a linear regression. We can 
use scikit learn to see and we got like 102 awesome that's the same 197 almost that's pretty much the same so we did using pytorch and gradient descent we fit a linear regression that matches the linear regression of scikit learn of course that's expected right but we know that we haven't done any mistakes in the code everything is running fine uh, if you look at the loss at the end, remember it started at 0.75 something. Now it's really, really close to zero, right? It's still a tensor. Remember, if I want to do to NumPy, right? There's uh, I should I told you, okay, you you should throw a CPU first because it will bring the data, the tensor from the GPU to the CPU and then to NumPy, but still is giving us an error. So the thing is, the loss requires gradient, right? The loss is one of the variables that computes gradients. Uh, and if you want to, to make sure that this doesn't give a, a different error, you should also detach it. So if you do like this, then you get the loss as a NumPy array. If it, and if, if you don't need to, if you think that's okay, too much trouble and you don't need a NumPy array right away, you can always use item or to list they will take care of these, all these, these um, unpacking for you, right? So you see, it will be, give you again the same result without having to do detach and CPU and NumPy. So yeah, that's that's a lot, a lot. I know. Uh, I hope it it helps you um, understand that at, at least have an initial uh, idea of all the different components that we talked talked about, right? Um, and uh, as as uh, also as a small gift to to everyone that attended, I created a coupon called Data Hour. So if you click here, uh, you can get the first volume of my book that covers these topics that we discussed in this webinar and more in more detail for only one ninety five, right? So the the listing price is usually fourteen ninety five, but for everyone that's here, if you use this coupon, you get for one ninety five. So um, this coupon is going to be valid for the next couple of days. So if you like, if you're interested in learning more about PyTorch, uh, you can also download a free sample if you want. But yeah, thanks a lot for, for having me here. I hope you enjoyed everything. <laughs> Sorry if it was <laughs> a bit too fast. <clears throat> uh, we have a question from our attendee. So would you like me to moderate them for you or uh, you want to take them for yourself? So can you please repeat? Uh, we have a question from attendee. So would you like mm -hmm. me to moderate them for you or uh, you want to take them for yourself? So I did not know. So you, you mean? Um, uh, like we have a question from attendee. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the, the model, what what I did not understand. Uh, what no issue, no issue. I, I'll ask the question. Uh, no issues. Uh -huh. Like, uh -huh. would you like to, like, should I moderate it for you, the question, or will you take it by yourself? Uh, I don't know. There is a okay. Uh, uh, where yeah, yeah. I, I I'll take the question. No issues. Uh, Mayan Gupta asks, what is the difference between LSNE and MSE, or do they belong to a similar family of models? So uh, LSNE least square. Uh, what was the acronym of that? LSNE. Yeah, I also like uh, like uh, you can see the question in Q and A section uh, below. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think he might have written something wrong. LSNE. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I'm. I don't. I don't. Don't recall this acronym. Let me check. Uh, no. Yeah, he might have. Like, <laughs> yeah, so I think that's. Yeah. I was sorry. I died. <laughs> yeah, no Yeah, he might have written like, something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there are more uh, questions. He's writing that L. L S N E. Yeah, sorry, I, be, I really not familiar with that acronym. And to be, maybe L S and be least square, but what would be the N in that case? Yeah, sorry, I really, I really not don't know that one. Uh, activation function is available in PyTorch. Yes, yeah, there are activation functions. There is a whole module of activation functions. You're gonna find all of those, like Relu, uh, from Sigmoid and Tanage to Relu, Gelu, and so many others. Oh yeah, there are there are many. And yeah, I see lots of thanks, thanks, thanks everyone. I really enjoyed that you liked the session. Ah, so someone said when able to check out and purchase the book. So yeah, yeah, this is something that uh, that's maybe confusing for from from Gumroad. Sorry about that. 
uh, if you see here, you actually have to type like here 195 and then you can do it, right? So that's uh, because you, you have this free price thingy. Then if you don't type the price, I mean, if you want to give me two bucks, right? That that's <laughs> that's cool also. But you can just type the the 195 here and you'll be able to check out. So yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned this is really confusing UX from them. The uh, what's the best activation function? Oh, um, I would say that the the best in the sense that the, the most commonly used that you can use without having much concern is ReLU, right? Or like this leaky ReLU. Actually, it's one of the you most of the time you use it and it should be fine because they 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 will do they will allow your model to learn faster. Uh, and of course, no one uses TanH or sigmoids anymore. Sigmoids just for binary classification in the end. Uh, but for the intermediate layers, it's always uh, ReLU or leaky ReLU or GALU, depending on some, some models have it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Glad it worked.